Hello, here I am again in the name of the Sovereign Creator of Heaven and Earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm continuing my exposition of my translation of Acts, based on Family 35 Greek text. Okay, now we come to chapter 14. Iconium, that'll take us what, verses 1 through 7. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together into the synagogue of the Jews, and they spoke to such effect that a large number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the disobedient Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Even so, they stayed there a considerable time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, giving signs and wonders to take place by their hands. Well, <clears throat> the population of the city became divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. But when a plot was hatched by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they became aware of it and escaped to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, Derby, and the surrounding area, where they continued to preach the gospel. There's not a great deal to comment on here. It's pretty straightforward. I would just like to repeat again what we have here in verse 3. Nothing like supernatural demonstrations of God's power or visible demonstrations of God's power to enhance the, <laughs> the effect of what you're saying. And here we have God giving signs and wonders to take place by their hands. The signs and wonders are the, are the result of God's initiative. Now we move on to Lystra. Verses 8 through 13 to start, then there'll be more from 14 to 18, but I'll just read 8 through 13 first. Well, in Lystra, a certain man with helpless feet was sitting. Start parentheses, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked, close parentheses. This man was listening to Paul speaking, who, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And the man jumped up and began to walk. Now, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in Lycaonium, like Ionian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought bulls and garlands to the gates, intending to make a sacrifice along with the crowd. As in chapter 3, you remember that Peter and John heal the man lame from birth. Here, this man was also lame from birth. He had never walked. So the miracle obviously included his head, not just his limbs, since he had never learned to walk. I mean, just because you get healed, that doesn't mean you know how to walk. You have to learn. But obviously, the uh, miracle was double that way. The man was able... Not only that, he just jumped up. That's what the text says. He jumped up and began to walk. Well, that, of course, preserved, preserved, produced quite an effect on the people. From their worldview, these were the gods that had come down. They called Barnabas Zeus, Paul Hermes, because he was the one who did the talking. And there was a temple of Zeus out in front of the gate of the city, and the priest then, brought bulls and so on. This was perfectly appropriate within their, from their point of view, within their worldview, within their religion, that was the right thing to do. If the gods had come down, hey, we've got to do something. Now let's read 14 through 18. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard it, they tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, giving you good news telling you to turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. 
who in the former generations allowed all the ethnic nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, doing good, giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things, they barely stopped the crowd from sacrificing to them. Well, you know, here we have an extemporaneous speech. <laughs> this was a totally unexpected situation. They didn't have any time to prepare a sermon. <laughs> Notice what they did, though. Notice what they did. They emphasized the Creator God. Same thing that Paul is going to do on, on the Acropolis in Athens. He's going to emphasize the Creator God. That's where you start with someone who doesn't, a, a, a pure pagan, someone who doesn't know anything about anything. You don't start with Jesus. You start with God as creator. You have to, you have to establish it. We have a creator. We aren't here by evolution. We aren't here by chance. We aren't here. We have a creator and so on. That's where they started. Now, they say that what they are doing is useless. So they're not going to, once they stop and think about it, people stop and think about what was said, they're not going to like that all that while. We're telling you to turn from these useless things to the living God. He says, in former generations, God allowed the ethnic nations to walk their own ways, so on so and such. But he did not leave himself without witness. So here he, the, whether it was mainly Paul that did the speaking, probably, but he says, the very fact that God gives us food and so on, fruitful seasons, rain, all of this is proof of God's grace. So what we call this is uh, generic grace. Grace that is, that is given to everyone, not just to God's people. And even so, <clears throat> they barely stopped the crowd from going ahead with the sacrifice. Well, now we come to a sad story. <clears throat> Verses 19 through 20. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came. And having persuaded the crowd, and having stoned Paul, they dragged him out of the city, supposing him to have died. But as the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Well, you know the crowds can be fickle. And of course, as I said, the, the apostles had called their religion useless. Obviously, several days had elapsed. I mean, it takes the Jews a little while to get there from Antioch and Iconium. <coughs> and obviously, this was a planned thing, although probably there was some demonic in involvement in the whole situation as well. They dragged him by the feet, probably, like an animal. They were really being real nice here. Just dragged him out of the city. How did they drag? Probably grabbed his feet. Just dragged him out like he was an animal. <coughs> Notice that the disciples stood around him. <coughs> Excuse me. I gather that the attack was sudden, unexpected. It had been planned that way. So the disciples didn't have any clue. They were not prepared. So there was no chance to try to defend Paul. And Paul certainly looked dead. <laughs> the people had stoned him, dragged him out. They were sure he was dead. That's why they just threw the body out there and went their way. And the disciples are just standing around trying to assimilate it. Oh, good night. What has happened? Dear God, how come? <laughs> he gets up. Goes into the city, and the next day he and Dr. Barnabas move on. Notice that Paul's recovery was sufficient so that he could set out the next day on foot. And they, did, they went on foot, they walked. So God obviously restored Paul in a supernatural fashion so that he could just carry on like normal the next day. Okay, now we come to verses 21 through 28 that will finish chapter 14. 21. When they had evangelized that city, 
that city being Derby, and disciple the good number, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every congregation, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord into whom they had believed. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. When they had declared the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From there they sailed to Antioch, from where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had completed. So, upon arriving and gathering the congregation, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And that's the end of the first missionary journey. Now notice that they returned to Lystra. They just went back the way they had come. You might suppose that they would have tried to avoid Lystra because that was where Paul was stoned. No. No. Perhaps upon reflection, the locals were ashamed of what they had done. Besides, <laughs> what do you do to a man you've already killed? <laughs> Have you thought about that? What do you do to a man you've already killed? <laughs> if he comes back, you kind of, it'll kind of get discouraging, you know. <laughs> you kill a guy and then he comes back. Obviously, of course, they were counting on God's protection, and probably the first time around it was all a surprise attack. Now there's not going to be any surprise attack, thank you. But obviously also they were there to strengthen the believers. That's what it says. Exhorting them to continue the faith. Notice, though, what the second half of verse 22 says. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Is that what you preach in your church? Or is that what they preach there if you're not the preacher? Does that sound like easy street? You know, just believe in Jesus and everything will be hunky-dory. No problem, you know. Bed of roses? Not quite. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Well, you know, I don't enjoy hardship. I tell you frankly, I don't enjoy it. And whenever it happens, I usually complain a little bit. But, you know, we shouldn't really be all that surprised. That's just the way it is. Through many hardships, we enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders, obviously the first time around, someone had to appoint the elders, which, of course, the apostles did in every congregation. Sure. The congregations need leadership. Okay, that's obvious. And they did it with prayer and fasting. You know, they just didn't know the people all that well, okay? They just come through, spent a little time, but they didn't really know the people. Who knows the people? Well, God knows the people. So, they prayed with fasting, therefore, <clears throat> presumably guided by God in their choice of the elders. And they commended them to the Lord, into whom they have believed. You have heard me before, you know what that's all about. You don't believe in Jesus, you believe into him. But notice what is said here. They commended them to the Lord, into whom they believe. You have to learn how to walk on your own two feet. You can't walk on my feet. So everyone has to learn how to walk with God on their own. Now we can give example, we can give encouragement, we can, but everyone has to learn how to walk with God on their own two feet. That's it. They commended them to God, His grace, and so on. So they just carried on, but they're preaching wherever they go. So on, and they finally they get back to Antioch where they had started out. They give a report to the congregation. God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and how? And they stayed there for a while. Okay, now we come to chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. I'm going to read first verses 1 through 5. 
Then some men came down from Judea and started teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, this provoked serious dissension and argument between Paul and Barnabas and them. So, Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with certain others of them, to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the congregation, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brothers. Upon arriving in Jerusalem, they were received by the congregation and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Already, you see, even way back when, the Jews had a hard time disassociating themselves from what they had always believed, that they were better than the Gentiles, that they were God's chosen people, and that the, the Gentiles just were something else. And now, when we're beginning with Cornelius, God starts saving the Gentiles, they just can't handle that very well. And some of them never made the transition. But you just stop and think about it. What's the Great Commission all about? What did Jesus say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody. Make disciples in all the ethnic nations. Now, look, you can't make a disciple without talking to them, can you? You've got to talk to them. You've got to associate with them. It's obvious. So this bit about, you know, with, when... Cornelius, Peter, who oh, you entered a Gentile's uh, look. <laughs> That's gone. That's gone. It's different now. They're no different. We have to reach everyone and we have to talk to them, obviously. Okay. These poor people, you know, they just haven't gotten over the fact of the law of Moses. Apparently, these guys that came up to Antioch, uh, made enough noise that they could not solve the situation locally. And what they had to do finally was to send a delegation to Jerusalem where they, there were still some apostles, plus elders and so on, to get a final word, as it were, or at least an authoritative word on this question. So now we come to the council itself. I will now read verses 6 through 11. Well, I'll read it next time. 